on. Hello, hello everybody. I can uh, I can uh, replace momentarily um, Umberto Delgado Rosa. I'm Anne Teller from DG Environment, the uh, biodiversity unit, and I've been working with uh, my uh, dear colleagues Joachim Maas and Marcus Erhardt on this ecosystem assessment uh, for eight years now. Um, hello everybody. I can. Uh, opportunity to uh, to say that um, in 2012 I had exactly the same dress and uh, we it was then that we launched this EU initiative on mapping and assessment of ecosystems and their services which now is delivering the assessment itself it took us eight years uh, that's a long time but we were not inactive we had a lot of uh, uh, guidance document produced and I always remind me if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go deep go together so now we will uh, have a presentation of this very robust uh, assessment which we hope will be a good baseline for the eu biodiversity strategy 2030 and uh, and its uh, evidence base and so i'm very pleased to uh, introduce today um, there will be a presentation by joachim maas um, animated by uh, with uh, marcus erhardt from eea and and myself and then we will have um, uh, an intervention from hans breunings the executive director of the environment agency and uh, finished last but not least uh, by Giovanni De Santi, who is director at uh, the Joint Research Center of the Commission. So um, Umberto should join us as soon as uh, he's available, but uh, let's not uh, waste uh, time and start the presentation. Yes, I forgot to say an important thing for as personal personally it's that um, on 29th of September Georgina Mace passed away and uh, it was a very very big loss for us because she she inspired the, the work uh, throughout the process and I'm sure she will continue to inspire us so we have dedicated this assessment to us so Joachim you have the floor Thank you, Anne, and also thank you to the many colleagues that have uh, contributed to the assessment, either as chapter leader, as author, as data provider, or as reviewer. Thank you to the audience to uh, participate to this session. We will now take about 30 minutes, 35 minutes to present um, some main conclusions of the assessment. You can ask questions to us by using the big question mark at the bottom right of uh, your screen. And we will also um, launch now and then a poll. So we will have some questions for you. And we have short breaks during the presentation in order to address any of your questions to us. The EU ecosystem assessment um, is an analysis of the pressures, the condition, and the services delivered by ecosystems of marine, freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems of the EU and the UK. We use 2010 as a baseline year. It is based on the best available data sets that we have at European level. Um, and we use over uh, 130 unique indicators to do this assessment. The to evaluate the 2020 biodiversity targets, but we also provide a baseline for the 2030 biodiversity policy, and I think in particular also for its EU nature restoration plan. Here we show the relationships between pressures, ecosystem condition, and ecosystem services. People have positive and negative impacts on ecosystems. Impacts are conservation and restoration. Negative impacts are pressures, such as pollution. Pressures decrease the condition of ecosystems. That means that they decrease the physical, the chemical and the biological quality of an ecosystem. A loss in condition is mostly associated with a loss of ecosystem services, such as carbon sequestration, or how ecosystems protect us against natural disasters. Very high pressures on ecosystems lead to ecosystem degradation, which we define as a persistent decline in the condition of an ecosystem. 
It means also that sustainable management of ecosystems ensure that systems remain in the good condition. The ecosystem assessment itself is organized and reported as follows. We have a series of thematic ecosystem assessments in the report. They analyze the total area, pressures, condition of ecosystems. They make a synthesis, they address knowledge gaps, and we present policy options. We have also a series of cross-cutting ecosystem assessments that look at trends in climate and climate change, invasive alien species, landscape, soil, and ecosystem services. Both the thematic and the cross-cutting assessments, they inform an integrated ecosystem assessment, and we illustrate that in the report with a number of what we call integrated narratives on key policy issues. These narratives, they bring different elements and results of our findings together in a simple policy relevant storyline. The presentation today will actually draw mainly on these integrative aspects uh, of the assessment. Before we move on with the presentation, I'll show you here a picture of a key pressure of ecosystems, which is invasive alien species. These plants are water hyacinths, a species from South America, and they have an enormous potential to cover the entire surface of lakes um, in, in Europe and elsewhere. So I'm going to launch a first question and then um, uh, for you um, using the poll. The question is, which of the following ecosystems is most affected by invasive alien species? The poll just started, you have some time to uh, vote. And in the meantime, I'm checking with Anne if we have already a question from the audience that we can address. Anne? Yes, uh, there is no question at the moment, Joachim. Um, so I guess you may, you may want to say a bit more about uh, these five pressures that uh, IPES was uh, referring to in its recent uh, assessment. Yeah, so actually the next slide on will, uh, we, there we will show uh, some of the main um, outcomes and the main um, pressures that, that we analyzed in the assessment and we will effectively so give some, some, some results on these. In the meantime, the, the, the polls are coming in. You have just a few more seconds to um, reply. Maybe Joachim, uh, while we are still waiting, could you say um, the relationship with the state of nature, which was released yesterday? I mean, there were articles in the newspaper, at least in in Le Soir, in Belgium. So uh, how this assessment is uh, uh, complementing the state of nature? Yeah, but maybe this is also something for Marcus to address from the, the EEA. So, Marcus, could you maybe explain how we used the, the EEA State of Nature report in our assessment? Thank you, Joachim. Uh, so, what we try to do is we just try to combine uh, the both. Um, means we have, with the mass assessment, we have the first uh, assessment which really covers the Europe. Um, this is unique and, no, uh, and so this is really a step forward for the outreach into agriculture and forest ecosystems and the other ecosystems which are not covered for, by the nature report. The nature report as such covers uh, the so-called Annex 1 habitats, which is about one quarter of the European land surface. And um, these results, of course, were uh, taken and uh, guided us uh, towards the evaluation of the condition of the of the other ecosystems. So it's fully integrated. It is somehow harmonized, but of course, there is still a difference in, in terms of the coverage. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So in the meantime, uh, the audience should see the results. Most of you think, 34%, that grasslands are the most um, um, infected ecosystem followed by um, urban ecosystems. So let's actually have a look at the results from our assessment. And the audience was quite right. 
being uh, be it that the order is different so almost 70 percent of urban ecosystems are now heavily invaded by invasive alien species but also grasslands suffer substantially from um, invasives how do we know this we actually use the map that you see on the left hand side of the slide it records the the presence of invasive alien species in europe based on the best available information that we have Invasive alien species, as Anne said, represents only one of the pressures that lead to degradation of ecosystems. This is also the case for the frequency of extreme droughts as a result of climate change. This frequency is increasing. Also in forests, we observed that more trees have damaged leaves, a process called defoliation. In in agroecosystems, we see a strong decline of farmland biodiversity and marine stocks are being overfished, in particular in the Mediterranean and in the Black Sea. However, there are some positive signs as well. Air quality and water quality is increasing in, in Europe, is improving. Forests are expanding and there is more dead wood, which is a proxy for forest biodiversity. We see also that the level of organic farming is increasing and up, and up to now, 7% um, of Europe's agricultural land is under organic farming. Also, the efforts to reach maximum sustainable yield of the fishery in the Northeast Atlantic are being more successful. The progress that we see um, in these areas that were just mentioned shows for us that a persistent implementation of policies can be effective to protect ecosystems. However, this key message also comes with a strong warning because the positive effects that we see of the declining trends in land take, in air and water pollution on ecosystems risk to be overtaken by increasing impacts of invasive alien species, but also of climate change. Let's look at climate change. We mapped here the, an, an aggregated indicator, which is based on 15 bioclimatic variables, which are based on temperature, rainfall, and drought in Europe. It clearly situates the worst problems of climate change in the Mediterranean biogeographical region, but also in Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. This excludes more extreme drought events, lower effective rainfall, higher temperatures. This is a cocktail for forest fires and further ecosystem degradation. Climate change will also drive species north to more uh, to, to um, higher latitudes. We can actually, if we want, if we can facilitate these species movements by building a more coherent network of nature. And we dwell on that in the report as well. The green areas that you see on this European map are the Natura 2000 sites, but in combination with unprotected land, but where nature, where natural ecosystems are the dominant land type. The blue arrow that you see in the inset map is actually an existing transboundary ecological corridor in Portugal that connects larger patches of nature in Spain. Conserving these existing ecological corridors is going to be important to allow species to migrate and to respond to climate change. However, we have to build new corridors as well by restoring ecosystems. Where you see the blue arrows, these, if we would restore areas where you see the, blues, the blue arrows, these areas would really create a bridge between the Pyrenees and between the Alps, and they would connect vast areas of nature in the EU. In both cases, there is a role for the EU because we can here facilitate trans transboundary collaboration between the member states. Good, we have time for a second break here, and um, the next set of slides will actually review the current protection levels of ecosystems in the EU. So I'm going to launch for you a question about 
forests and the protection of forests. So the question is, what percentage of the EU forest area is protected under the Natura 2000 network? You can start voting now and I'm going to give the floor back to Anne to see if we have already questions from the audience. Thank you, uh, Joachim. Yes, there is a question and I will ask uh, Marcus. Um, it's about, uh, the question is, is asking whether there is a, a separate complete assessment for the marine ecosystems and not just fisheries as, as a, a pressure. Because uh, at the moment, uh, most of the um, discussion presentation has been on terrestrial, on land ecosystems. Marcus? Thank you, Anne. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, a marine assessment in uh, in the report as such, and of course, and it tries to follow the, the same concept as all the other terrestrial assessments and the freshwater assessments. So we look on the condition, we look on the pressures, we look uh, what is available from the uh, from the member states reporting, mainly the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and there are of course additional uh, information. Uh, which are directly linked to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the MSFT, uh, and the, the reports are also available also on the EA websites. Thank you. Joachim, the poll is... Uh... Yeah, the poll is finished, so I'm going to just read out the results. Most of the audience thinks that 23% of the area of the EU's forest is under Natura 2000. 39% thinks this is 13%, and then 16% thinks it is 33%. Let's have a look at the results and then continue. So most of you were effectively right. 23% of the forest area in, in the EU is protected under the Natura 2000. Here is a first, here, here is a slide on the total size, the total area of ecosystems in Europe. As you can see, marine ecosystems in terms of area outnumber land and freshwater ecosystems. Then on land, cropland and forest are almost equal in size, followed by grassland. Forest, cropland and grassland taken together cover about 85% of the EU land area. The remaining 15% is actually made up by urban ecosystems, heatlands and shrubs, rivers and lakes, sparse vegetation like mountains, but also coastal uh, um, systems like dunes and beaches, and wetlands. For wetlands, we use an extended definition, which overlaps to some extent with the other ecosystem types, but more on wetlands also later uh, in our presentation. Let's have a look now at the legal designation of all these ecosystems under three important environmental directives of the EU. First of all, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It covers or it protects the entire marine ecosystem area, but it also um, covers to some extent wetlands, at least the coastal part of wetlands. On the slides, you always see the percentages that are covered by every, uh, um, every directive. The same is a bit for the Water Framework Directive. It covers the coastal area to some extent, about 6%. It covers all rivers and lake ecosystems, and it covers about 44% of the EU's wetland. Whereas the Marine Strategy Framework Directive tries to bring marine ecosystems in a good environmental status, the Water Framework Directive aims to bring freshwater systems in a good ecological status. Let's add the Habitats Directive. The Habitats Directive um, covers different shares uh, of ecosystems. First of all, it does not include cropland or urban ecosystems, and it only covers a small part of marine ecosystems. About 60% of the total area of marine ecosystems is designated as Annex 1 habitat under the Habitats Directive. 
als we nood de, de rare ecosystems are better protected than the common ecosystems. The purpose of the habitat directive is to bring habitats within these ecosystems in a favorable conservation status. A key instrument in doing so, in achieving this status, is the Natura 2000 network. This network covers all ecosystems, but again to a varying degree. Note that 8% of cropland is protected by Natura 2000, but also 3% of urban ecosystems are actually Natura 2000 sites. Clearly, some ecosystems, forests, croplands, grasslands and urban are proportionally less covered than other ecosystems, notably heatlands and shrubs, mountains, dunes, wetlands and freshwater ecosystems. These systems are proportionally better covered um, under the current environmental legislation. However, those ecosystems that are indicated in the red box, they represent 90% of the EU land, they deliver 75% of ecosystem services, and they are crucially important reservoirs of Europe's biodiversity. Let's talk a bit more about how these systems deliver ecosystem services as we do have a, a special chapter on ecosystem services in the report. We use two indicators. We use the potential that ecosystems have to deliver specific ecosystem services or put it differently, we have quantified how much ecosystems can actually give to people and we see that, that um, this potential is declining. The demand for services, or how much people actually want from ecosystems, has been increasing during the same period. In other words, we, we are becoming more and more dependent on ecosystems. Our assessment estimates that 50% of the current demand for ecosystem services is not or partially satisfied. Now, can we make this number a bit more concrete? Um, and I'm going to use flood protection as an example. Flood protection means that upstream ecosystems often protect downstream areas from flooding, and they do so by retaining and storing water from precipitation. The graph on the left-hand side shows that forests and wetlands, they are particularly effective in delivering this service. But I, we also note that urban areas and green spaces in cities or croplands can be managed in such a way that they have a good potential to store water. Between 2006 and 2012, we report in our assessment a net loss of this flood control potential at aggregated EU level. In that same period, people kept on building houses and infrastructure in floodplains. The result has been an increasing flood risk. And the map that you see on the, on the right hand side identifies areas where nature based solutions uh, to flood protection are necessary to better protect people and infrastructure in downstream areas. The graph on the left hand side also helps us to, to identify and use the right mix of ecosystems to provide these nature based solutions. So in conclusion, uh, for this section, um, the following key messages. We note that people are becoming more and more dependent on ecosystems. That means that upscaling conservation and restoration of all terrestrial ecosystems is needed to reverse the loss of ecosystem services and to meet the growing demands of society. And I underlined here the word all, because also urban green spaces Specific croplands or forests that are not protected, they can contribute substantially to restoration and conservation targets that will be developed under the 2030 biodiversity strategy. I promised that we would say something on wetlands um, and I'm going to launch a new question for the audience on um, wetlands. So the question is, which statement that you will see about wetlands is a correct statement? 
The poll is launched now, so you will see it. Um, and I'm looking again at Anne to see if we need to address a specific question from the audience. Thank you, Joachim. There are indeed two questions. So I will ask Marcus again. Um, the first one is about does the legal designation take into account also regional and national legal designation? So not only the EU, the EU one for Natura, because uh, it it, uh, in, it's important in terms of uh, uh, future needs. Marcus. Johan, yeah, we have uh, the both. Uh, so we mainly focus on, on the Natura 2000, of course, and the protection status here. But we have also the statistics uh, for the so-called CDDA uh, areas. There is also an overlap. Uh, so sometimes the areas are designated under both legislation frameworks, the national as well as the European one. And the statistics are usually found in the annex of the report where the URL, the link to this report is provided at the end of this presentation. You and Joachim, um, so no cropland or urban habitats as annex one or very little, but large areas included in um, in for birds in Natura 2000 for birds. So the question is uh, whether uh, the assessment is um, um, yeah taken uh, was taking into account these elements. Yeah, indeed. So so we we um, our analysis shows indeed that that um, that specific urban habitats or cropland habitats that sometimes do have high biodiversity values are not um, um, included in the Annex 1 um, of the assessment, but, it, but effectively uh, that the Natura 2000 network sometimes extends in these um, managed ecosystems and that, um, that this, this means that Natura 2000 can effectively be a, a tool for conservation in these um, um, ecosystems that sometimes are overlooked in, in um, nature planning. Good, I think we have the questions for the poll. I think 88% um, um, of you selected the first answer which means that ecosystem that wetlands are net carbon sinks. Here is the correct answer. Well, wetlands are net carbon sinks under the condition that they are managed well. Wetlands are carbon sources actually because of unsustainable management. Now let's have um, a look um, on the results of wetlands. Actually, we started the ecosystem assessment two years ago, at least the technical work for the assessment. And we, we started that under the assumption that 2% of the EU's land is covered by a wetland. We are now two years later and we realized that wetlands actually cover 8% of the EU. Many ecosystems such as wet grasslands, wet heatlands, riparian areas, floodplains, swamp forests and coastal wetlands are often considered and classified as uh, under other ecosystem types. What remains are the inland wetlands, such as marshes and peatland, and especially peatland is exploited in the EU for peat extraction. As a result of this, wetlands end up being reported as net carbon emitters in official greenhouse gas accounting systems. But this kind of, of, of reportation actually risks to, under, to, to, to greatly underestimate the carbon potential of wetlands. Our assessment shows that wetlands are in a very poor condition and restoring wetlands should be a priority. Wetlands would benefit from a more coherent policy framework aligned with the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, but also with the Paris Agreement and with the Sustainable Development Goals. We also must address further knowledge gaps on wetlands and in particular how wetlands in the future will respond to climate change. Um, and we need to know uh, specifically, we need to know more about the fluxes of greenhouse, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane between wetlands and the atmosphere. Our key messages on wetlands 
I think a bit in contrast to rivers and lakes, wetlands have insufficiently profited from legal designation under the EU laws uh, on environment, but also often due to a lack of a proper definition and classification. We concluded that wetlands remain in a poor condition, and this strongly undermines their potential to deliver important ecosystem services like uh, recreation, bird watching, sequestration and storage of carbon, protection against flooding, and wetland biodiversity. The next slide is a picture um, of butterflies that are um, pollinating or um, taking nectar from a certain crop. So we have a final break here. I'm going to launch a new poll specifically about um, butterflies. The question for the audience is, since 1990, the grassland butterfly index in Europe has decreased with, and then how many percentage? Um, are there maybe questions about wetlands or about uh, previous statements uh, on uh, of the presentation? Oh, uh, I don't see any, but um, uh, I have. Uh, I wanted to stress myself uh, an important point that you raised, and that's uh, member states under the LULUCF regulation, so land use, land use change, forest regulation, uh, provide accounting reports on emissions and absorption uh, of greenhouse gas um, in CO2 equivalents and indeed in these reports because of the bias that you mentioned that uh, it's mainly about uh, peatlands um, there uh, the wetlands are, are considered as uh, net emitters of uh, greenhouse gas and this was uh, a, a problem we had in our conversation between uh, the biodiversity and the uh, climate uh, policies, but now we have uh, engaged a very constructive dialogue with DG Clima and we are busy trying to um, remediate this bias. So hopefully in the future we will have a better um, accounting of what uh, of the role of wetlands not only in terms of biodiversity but also in terms of carbon retention thank you okay i'm going to send the results to um, the voters of our fourth and last poll here they come actually half of you think that um that uh, we lost 64 percent um, of grassland butterfly populations since 1990 here is the correct answer. It's it's uh, it's less dramatic, but it's still substantial. Um, the the abundance of grassland butterfly populations in Europe has fallen by thirty nine percent since nineteen ninety. To us, this indicator is a strong sign that pollinate, pollinating species, including butterflies but also bees and bumblebees, moths, hooverflies are under strong uh, pressure. Why is this important? Here we mapped the condition or the suitability of ecosystems in the EU to deliver pollination services. And we also mapped the demand for pollination, which is set by the area of fruit trees and vegetable crops that need pollinators um, for production. The demand has increased with 5% over the last decade. In contrast, this potential has dropped with 1% over the last decade. This identifies an increasing mismatch between potential and demand for pollination, and this is what we call a pollination deficit in the report. This deficit is here mapped in blue. We conclude that as much as 51% of the pollinator dependent crops in the EU are actually grown in areas of land with a low condition to support pollinators. Addressing this pollination deficit would bring benefits to farmers. And it is possible by restoring specific habitats in the cropland that support pollinator populations like bees, bumblebees, butterflies, and overflies. 
But restoring farmlands brings additional benefits as well. It results in better water quality. It, it increases the landscape amenity. It simply makes our social ecological system more resilient. With our EU ecosystem assessment, we can actually help identify those areas that are in the greatest need for these services. Time is lacking to, to go over many um, other um, elements, results and conclusions of the assessment, but I just want to still mention forests and marine ecosystems. For forests, we noted some encouraging signs of recovery, but pressures on forests still remain very high and they undermine the forest condition. For marine ecosystems, we still we know that they are covered by a fairly comprehensive policy framework, but the impact on, of that framework on marine condition remains to some extent unknown because of data gaps. Now I, I come to my conclusions. Um, first of all, about these data gaps, we think we need that they have to be addressed by an enhanced capacity of the EU to monitor, detect and report changes in biodiversity and in ecosystems. I mean, we, we used in our assessment about 132 unique indicators that tell us something about pressures, condition and services. But of these 132, only two indicators, which are, and you have seen them um, in the assessment, um, grassland butterfly, uh, butterfly populations, but also common birds for farmland and forests, only two of the indicators actually describe the state of species and species diversity in Europe. All the others are more um, um, proxies to biodiversity. This needs to change. We need to enhance our capacity to monitor biodiversity in the field and to understand why biodiversity is changing in Europe. And there we still run a bit short. We conclude that the EU's ecosystems are not in a good condition, but we, we, have, the, we have the capacity to bend the curve. The progress that we see in some areas tells us that an ambitious agenda on ecosystem restoration is a realistic and an achievable goal. Now science has to work with policy to define specific targets and references for ecosystem condition that can guide uh, this ecosystem restoration agenda. So far for the presentation uh, of the assessments, um, you will find more info on these links. The report is also published on the website of the Joint Research Center. I'm handing over to Anne again, and then maybe also to uh, Umberto, if he have, uh, has joined this session. As I'm here, I hope you can listen to me. Uh, I'm so sorry that I arrived late, changing from one session to the other. Proved a bit difficult from another platform. But before introducing uh, the next speaker, let me just say a couple of words that I actually would have wanted to say in the beginning. First of which is to congratulate, congratulate you, Joachim, the JRC, also DEA, and the colleagues intervening, in particular Marcus Herhardt, Sophie Condé, Dani Abdul Malak, and also to congrat congratulate Ann Teller for this great undertaking, this major undertaking, which is to have the first EU wide ecosystem assessment. And second, also to tell you that in Green Deal and biodiversity strategy context, this is a, a very promising tool for several of the things we want to attain such as the trans-European network uh, of nature, including ecological corridors, or the EU nature restoration plan, including in the biodiversity strategy, the upcoming legally binding restoration targets. Um, so everything we've heard here from, uh, from wetlands, their carbon-rich potential, the recovery of pollinators, uh, forests and that, what that can entail for the upcoming EU forest strategy and what this tool can deliver for monitoring is most welcome. Having said this, we will now listen to Hans Breunings. He is the executive director of the EEA. And uh, we know very well how DEA has a crucial role on the, the topic of biodiversity, streamlining and analyzing environmental data, including biodiversity data. 
from the from member states and wider uh, in Europe. So, Hans, if you are with us, the floor is yours, and thank you very much. Thank you, Umberto. I'm uh, I am indeed with you and happy to be with you all. I would like to start by echoing the the words of uh, Umberto. I think this is a monumental piece of work uh, in terms of methodology development in terms of uh, some of the technical data assimilation and working with a variety of sources, but also in terms of operationalizing some of the concepts that we like to throw around, but not always are very clear about what they mean in concrete terms, like uh, the, the, the concept of ecosystem services uh, as, as a critical element of this analysis. Secondly, I'd like to say that uh, it also shows how far we can get if we collaborate in a constructive way. Uh, the, I think the collaboration between the JRC, uh, the EEA here, the colleagues in ENF, but also using uh, elements of the Eurostat data, the broader research community, and I would like to also emphasize the national level experts, because let's not forget that MAS has a strong uh, national uh, linking as well. So I would like to say this is what collaboration can deliver at the European scale. The third thing I would like to say is that I think this is indeed unique information in support of a swiftly developing and ambitious European policy agenda, not only when it comes to biodiversity proper, but also when we speak about the linkages between biodiversity and climate, and those linkages are, are more and more apparent in our understanding, the linkages with agriculture, uh, the linkages with other elements of uh, how we work with nature uh, to serve uh, societal needs. So the understanding of where the drivers and the pressures in particular are, but also the services, I think is absolutely uh, critical. If I if I look at that, uh, it also the question is always and and so what does it contribute to solutions? Well, I think some of the slides that were shown, and some of the parts of the assessment, also point very strongly in the direction of solutions: uh, flood protection, pollination, but also the corridor approach when it comes to strengthening biodiversity. Fourthly, I would like to say that I think this unique information can be used even better if we consider it as a part of what I call a knowledge puzzle in support of the European policy agenda. We had the State of Nature report uh, that was presented earlier yesterday and the day before. We've got uh, the Knowledge Innovation Project on Natural Capital Accounting. We've got the Lucas uh, data and information. We've got Copernicus uh, data that is coming in every day. So if we look at this knowledge and information as a number of pieces of a puzzle in support of an agenda, and we come with a strategy that allows us to combine, connect, and then uh, use them in an assessment logic, I think we, we will be far ahead. Um, also, uh, when it comes to Europe's contribution at the global level, uh, when you look at uh, the, the UN SIA, uh, the, the uh, System of Environmental and Economic Accounting, but also the work under TEEP, I think Europe is clearly one of the leading players and with this mass assessment uh, that, that is made even more clearly. A, sec a fifth element uh, I would like to say is that we should be able to use this type of knowledge in a serious debate about uh, the shifting uh, nature of indicators we have about how we are doing as a society and how we look at the relationship between economic performance, uh, which we often express in financial capital or economic capital, uh, social capital and uh, natural capital and with the assessment made here I think we have an even stronger basis to say that natural capital is indeed a foundational capital for any society and that we need to look at uh, our economy not only through the lens of uh, GDP but also through the lens of what it what it can contribute to well-being uh, and to uh, strengthening and supporting the foundations 
of any society which is national natural capital two more short points i think one point for me is critical we have worked eight years on mass what will be the sort of regularity of this and how can we now make sure that uh, we can we can connect this in a in a faster more regularly updated way to the decision making process we we get quarterly updates on gdp we get <laughs> almost hourly and instantaneous updates on the stock market and every european citizen runs around with one of these giving us information in near real term on nearly everything we do in our life mostly uh, rather irrelevant in my personal opinion but still it is there eight years has been a long time we need to reflect on the timely nature of the type of information that is uh, in this type of report not that i'm naive and expect that ecosystems change overnight but we need a serious discussion on that and that leads me to my last point and i think umberto made that uh, link also the biodiversity strategy uh, has a rather of very ambitious set of ambitious but also innovative elements in it so how can we use innovation in monitoring reporting and assessing elements of that strategy and how can the experience of eight years and delivering such a monumental piece of work an impressive set information piece how can we use that in innovative ways to support the ambitions of the biodiversity strategy those would be my my points uh, to make thank you very much thanks a lot hans um i think we have uh, time for a couple of questions i've seen some coming in the chat so i would try to pick on them they were not directed to hans but feel free also to pick on them and if there's any uh, further question uh, specifically to one's intervention, just tell me. But from a couple of questions I've seen, was one was about the existence or not uh, good examples on sustainable market business models in using wetlands. And another question for forests, what are the main source of pressures, concerns? Are they linked to human interventions or to changing climatic conditions? I think Marcus had signaled some capacity to reply so maybe we can start with marcus and then hans can complement if he so wills is this okay uh thank you i i, I may start <laughs> um yeah for the market business for wetlands uh, it's not so straightforward but there are examples and there are increasing number for, of examples so on the one hand, there is this uh, small business um, uh, where farmers, for example, uh, get paid for managing the wetland and they could sell uh, the harvest because a lot of the um, uh, wetlands still have to be mowed on a regular basis to keep up the, the species diversity and avoid that uh, shrubs and, and trees are coming in. This is, uh, let's say, a, a small scale example where it works. And, uh, and of course, the, the economy is only, the market is only very local. But uh, I think a, a more important uh, a market opportunity here is first tourism. So in many areas, uh, Myers and Vaux are considered to be the eyes of the landscape. And uh, a lot of tourism uh, recreation is developing around that one. And if this Myers and Bogues are gone, then also the, the attraction is gone. So uh, it's, let's say, nature as the big attractor for, for events. And what is coming up, and there are some lo uh, local and regional examples. I remember correctly, for example, in the UK, but also in, in other parts of Europe, is uh, farmers and landowners to be compensated for temporal flooding of their their land to reduce the peaks of floods which may threat um, the, the important infrastructure so what we see of course also in the context of climate change there's an increasing um, risk for for floods uh, in many areas of europe causing huge damages and then to to reduce the peaks 
uh, temporary dams, uh, dams may be built and they may temporarily flood the land. This will, of course, affect the ecosystems. Uh, also, that we have a lot of temporary flooded wetlands in the riparian zones. And uh, such, there are, of course, compensation and trade, let's say, of ecosystem services, risk avoidance uh, strategies. And there might be many more, and others may aware of uh, better examples too. For forests, very quickly, yes, uh, I mean, climate change is a definitely a risk. We see in, in, in many parts of Europe, we see now forest damage, which is higher than even in the, in the worst time of, of acid rain in the, in the 70s and 80s. But it's also the trend to overexploit uh, forest resources in terms of overharvesting. And um, so this uh, uh, definitely the two major pressures we see currently. There is, of course, a co-effect of nitrogen uh, deposition, sometimes affecting forest structure, forest stability. Extreme events are coming uh, more and more important, especially fires, but also storm events. And uh, so we see, again, the direct changes of the average climate conditions, as well as the changes in the extreme events as, as being an increasing factor destabilizing our, our forests. Thank you. Anybody else to want to uh, intervene? Well, uh, briefly, uh, there is a new question that was uh, addressed to uh, Umberto and, and myself. Um, talking about the fact that some countries are not investing enough in monitoring their nature and their environment and how, how can we then uh, get a baseline that is reliable and, uh, and, and stimulate them to, to deliver? Well, I think, uh, first of all, th there is technological innovation that will allow us to, uh, to make a number of statements and assessments that, that are not only relying on that uh, and you could say that's avoiding the issue yes that is true but it can also prompt better monitoring on the ground and a good example is what we did on our air quality work uh, where we made an assessment for bulgaria uh, not based on their data delivered but on other sources of information and there was a there was a big reaction in society uh, on that and it prompted uh, better monitoring and sharing of data, transparent data on the ground. But more importantly, I think if we look at policy implementation and we do follow up, the commission follows up with countries on whether countries are indeed implementing and doing what they promise, maybe a more serious effort should be done in some cases on also uh, the monitoring and reporting part. Yeah. That is, that is an, an in essential part of implementing policies, but it's sometimes forgotten when we look at the implementation side of policies. So that, that would be my answer there. On the previous question, I think it's very clear that by now most people understand what investing in climate change means. You know, think of the sustainable finance taxonomy. I think understanding the benefits and the services coming from uh, nature and biodiversity will help us to frame why it is important to invest also in biodiversity and nature. Restoration, for example, doesn't fall from the sky. It requires investments. It requires a deliberate approach. And if we can make it clear why that is the case and what the benefits are, I think it will be easier to attract not only public investments, but also leverage private investments in this. Thank you. Well, maybe just before um, Giovanni would take over, um, a remark to, to the audience. If you have specific questions like you have on marine and on forests, do download the, the, the report. Check the lead author, for instance, for marine. This is Anna Adamo from the JRC. For forests, uh, the expert is Jose Barredo, and they can also help you further with the interpretation of the assessment. Thanks. Okay, so I can take I can take directly the floor.
Oh, uh, Giovanni. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> so, first of all, let me echo what also Merto and also Hans already said, that I want myself also to thank all the colleagues. In, in primis, you, of course, you are Kim as the leading author of this very important report, but uh, definitely all the colleagues from DG Environment, from the Environment Agency and from the GSC, uh, including, of course, the top centers from EA, that they did contribute to the report. This is very important. It's a very clear, uh, mild, mild uh, important improvement for the, the understanding of the status of our ecosystem. So I think that is a really result of a fruitful collaboration and getting profit from different and central, different roles that the organization plays. So the central role that you see is playing within the commission for creating, supporting, and making sense of the knowledge, the experience and capacity of the environmental agency to streamline environmental data from the member states to the EU, and finally the oversight of the DG environment colleagues. So I think that putting together these three functions, we managed to achieve a very important masterpiece, I would say, so a very important result. So again, this report, I think, is a very good example how in the future, you see, we continue to provide science in support to policy, you know, that in this case directly creating the biodiversity strategy. So, in fact, it does provide basis for the assessment of the biodiversity strategy to 2020, which was planned for 21, but it can be already considered as a baseline you know, for the 2030 biodiversity strategy because in the end it does describe a methodology you know, for the new natural restoration you know, uh, already announced in the new strategy. So I think that this is a report also in the forthcoming perspective. So, and then I would also say that it's not even and only useful for the biodiversity strategy because again the support that we provide now is very important for many other initiatives encompassed by the Green Deal. So if you do look simply at the zero pollution strategy, again, if you, as you said, Joachim, that the, there is an evident decline in trends of air and water pollutants, you know, uh, this is, to me, means that the very ambitious target of zero pollution strategy can be achieved. And again, if you do consider that this uh, report will also support, for example, farm to fork strategy, because again, the assessment highlights how agriculture, which don't forget manages 50% of the land, can do more to maintain biodiversity. So I think that, uh, I think that again, this is a kind of positive scene, a positive result that they can encourage also the obtainment of the farm to fork strategy. So, this report, again, does not even and only provide support to the biodiversity strategy, but is also very useful for other pieces, other strategy, other policies already foreseen or in the way to be put forward in the context of the Green Deal. So again, it's a very important masterpiece of how science at the center of different cross-cutting policies can be very useful on different fronts. Uh, and again, this report, can be also considered as a kind of example for the forthcoming and knowledge center on biodiversity, because you know that this afternoon, at the presence of the Commissioner for the for Environment and the presence also the Commissioner for Research, so our uh, Commissioner, we, we will launch the knowledge center on biodiversity. And this is again will operate in a similar way as we have now constructed this report. So we will get profit for all the sciences, all the scientists, all the key important stakeholders that we can contribute to develop the best ever possible knowledge, analysis and reporting you now on the different issues linked to biodiversity. So to be very short, if you do consider how this report was generated, it's very simple. The, the, the methodology is very nice because we started from a well-defined policy question from the Commission. Then we co-created cre co an indicator framework to measure change in the ecosystems, very much supported by our colleagues, of course, in RTD and ESTAT, and based on consultation 
with other policy digits. So it's not what just DJ Bannon, but all the other policy digits. GNC coordinated the analytical work and could rely on the support of EA. The analysis were reviewed by independent scientists and the conclusion and policy options have been commented by several commission services. So Agri, RTD, Estat, Environment, Clima and Mare. So in the end, what we do have? We do have a result which is scientifically robust, validated study based on the best available European data provided again by EA and then address specific policy needs. So it's not just an academic exercise. So there is a specific requirement. There is a, a, a very open consultation involving all the scientists and involving also the policy makers and getting brought from all the best possible evidence of data uh, available in, in, in Europe. So this is a methodology that I would like to see again replicated in many other reports or issues that will be now the matter of the Knowledge Center on, on Biodiversity, which again will be launched this afternoon. So what I do expect the next step will be again to support you know, the, 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 the possibility to set up new bonding targets for the restore ecosystem in the new bio, biodiversity strategy 2030. You know? And again, and I would like therefore to replicate this kind of uh, collaboration among EA, DG Environment, GSC, and other DGs. So this is the way we want to support again the new biodiversity study. So let me say in conclusion, I'm, I'm very, very proud that we all together managed to, to produce this kind of masterpiece in terms of methodology, in terms of results, given a very scientifically based overview, you know, and again, I think that this is the, the, the example to be following in the future. So I'm very op optimistic and very positive when I do look at the possible future development of this knowledge center of biodiversity and the way we will forward and, and we and will underpin the development of biodiversity strategy, but also, as I said, the Green Deal in general. So many other policy initiatives that are encompassed in the Green Deal. So, Again, thank you very much, Joachim. Thank you very much to all the colleagues from EA, from Environment, from the GSC. And again, I, I, I like to see again this kind of successful story repeated in the near future. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Giovanni. So this, um, I see that on, on, on our chat that Umberto has um, um, problems in, in connecting. So this concludes our session. I would also like to thank the audience for just staying with us. Um, and we invite you all to also participate to the launch of the Knowledge Center um, later this afternoon. Thanks and goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>